So what do we want to know now? What's the equivalent condition to this? The, deriv the second derivative being positive. So I think this is, in the life of any researcher, this is a joyous moment. Because you know that we will have to evaluate the second derivative of f of alpha and simply state that it's positive for any choice of straight line. So the answer will present itself as soon as we express what the second derivative of this function is. Let's remind, let's quickly run through the logic why that is. Because for any choice of straight line, if you pass a straight line through this minimum, along the straight line, f of alpha will experience a minimum. And so for any choice of say straight line, the derivative will be zero, and the second derivative will be positive. Okay? Okay. So all we have to do is evaluate what the second derivative is. I'm telling you, it will be perhaps a super messy expression involving these and their derivatives, right? So basically, second derivatives of f. We'll have to find the second derivative of this expression. I'll break it down a little bit more in just a second. And you will see that there will be three uses of the chain rule. There will be nine terms. It'll be a mess. Okay, before we take a second derivative, let's take stock of what this expression is. So what I will do now is erase this equals to zero because we're in the going for the second derivative. So it's not that it equals to zero. All right, so this is the expression for the derivative. This is still a function of alpha, but we have to be careful. How is it a function of alpha? It's a function of alpha because each one of these derivatives, we start with a function of x, y, and z, and so each one of these derivatives is still a function of x, y, and z, right? Think of a function x squared plus y squared plus z squared. You take a partial derivative, you still end up with a function of x, y, and z. That wasn't the best example. And then into that function of x, y, and z, we plug in how x depends on alpha, how y depends on alpha, and how z depends on alpha. That's the functional dependence, just like we did here. And the chain rule got us going. We have to be clear to ourselves that what we're looking at here is still functions of x, y, and z into which the equation for the straight line is plugged in. Okay? So when we now take the derivative of this with respect to alpha, it will be the derivative of this with respect to alpha, which will be a chain rule with three terms, plus the derivative of this, also x, y, z by chain rule, with respect to alpha, three more terms, plus this. Let me make a statement which you will ignore for now, but then if you, pre if you continue down this mathematical path, you'll think back to my saying it. Before you, take the before you take derivatives, what you must do is write an exact identity in the independent variables. And the independent variable here is alpha. And so what I have here is what in calculus you call an identity because it's true for all alpha. And only once the full dependence on variables is written out and you have a perfect identity in terms of the independent variable, only then can you start taking the derivatives. And we're in that position now, and this statement meant nothing to you, I know that, because it meant nothing to me when, when somebody told me that. But then I came back to it and it made sense. Okay, so let's get going with the chain rule. It will be d this dx, dx d alpha. So it'll be the second derivative of f with respect to x dx d alpha, which is what? n1, right? So it's n1, should I write n1 squared? Sure. I'm tempted to write n1, n1, but n1 squared. Plus, the derivative of this with respect to y, dy d alpha, what is dy d alpha? n2, and so this will be plus f sub x, y, n1, 
N2. And this, do you see this is one number? It's just that it has nine terms. Must be greater than zero for oh, any choice of n1, n2, and n3. Holy moly, how complicated does that look? But it is what it is. Except we now know linear algebra and we can rewrite it in matrix terms, can't we? And it will tell us something very beautiful. Let's rewrite this. How do we organize this one number with nine terms, a sum with nine terms, into a beautiful matrix expression? Let me do it equals. Now I'm going in this direction. So I'm now capturing this expression in matrix form. Have all of you done it? All right, did you guys get the same expression? So this needs to be greater than zero for all n1, n2, and n3 with a caveat unless all of them are zero. You're familiar with that caveat, aren't you? So this has a name. It's the, it's the matrix of second derivatives. Isn't it nice how, the, how second derivatives organize themselves naturally into a matrix? These are all ones with x, these are all the ones with y, these are all the ones with z. They, they belong in a matrix, they're n squared of them. So this matrix is called the Hessian. It's denoted by h, the Hessian. Interesting question about the Hessian, is it symmetric? If you said sometimes you're a math major. <laughs> a normal person would say yes. A math major would say sometimes. Yes, the, the derivatives commute. The cross derivatives dx dy and dy dx are, <laughs> most people would say always equal. A mathematician would say equal under certain circumstances. So your answer was exactly correct. But yeah, it is symmetric. You would have to think long and hard and something having to do with singularities, derivatives going to infinity, uh, to come up with a counterexample for any engineer and any applied scientist under most circumstances. Until that singularity is the very thing you're studying, derivatives commute. And d2f d, dx dy equals d2f e dy dx. Okay, so this is a symmetric matrix. And so what this condition, and the condition can then be written in matrix form like this. How beautiful is that? That it's a perfect analog of the one dimensional property. So this is equivalent to this, and this is equivalent to Hessian is positive definite. And if nothing else, other than the intrinsic beauty of how everything worked out perfectly, this tells you just how fundamental the concept of positive definiteness is. Because the question of finding minima is the central question in calculus. Some would say that's why calculus was invented. That's over, overreaching. But it's certainly a central problem in calculus and multivariable calculus. And you cannot do it without the concept of positive definiteness. So, to summarize, the, an the analog of the derivative being equal to zero and the second derivative being positive at that point is all partial derivatives equal zero and the Hessian is positive definite at that point. And negative definite in other words, strictly less than zero. It's called negative definite. We never mentioned that, but you, it's a simple concept if you know positive definiteness. For a maximum, and if it's neither, 
In other words, there are some positive pivots and some negative pivots, or some positive eigenvalues and some negative eigenvalues, then it's a saddle point, which means somewhere it go, in some direction it goes up, in another direction it goes down. So it's neither. But what's an inflection point in, um, in what ordinary calculus is much richer in multivariable calculus. And what's the equivalent of this, we don't know, we have to go to higher derivatives? Because if it's positive definite, minimum. If it's negative definite, maximum. If it's neither, has some positive elements and some negative elements, then it's a saddle point. It makes sense that it's called a saddle point? Up, up, you know, in front and the back, and side, yeah, you get it. You know what a saddle looks like, okay? So what's this equivalent of, we have to go look for higher derivatives? In what situation would we have to go to third derivative here, and to third partial derivatives, and fourth order maybe? I'm sure it's on the tip of your tongues. It's semi-definite. If it's positive, semi-definite, which means that it's in positive in some or most directions, but along some direction it's zero. So if you go further out, you're not quite sure whether it's going to do this, like x cubed, or this, like x to the fourth. So in the semi-definite cases is when you have to go to higher derivatives. So positive definite, a minimum. Negative definite, a maximum. Some mixture of positive and negative pivots or eigenvalues. A saddle point. Positive semi-definite, have to go to higher derivatives to see if it's really a minimum. And negative semi-definite, have to go to higher derivatives to see if it's really a maximum. 